In the last talk, we discussed some of the problems confronting development of new tools uh, to prevent and to treat tuberculosis. In this next segment, I really want to focus on the problem of antibiotic therapy and delve into this issue of why the antibiotics that we currently use to treat tuberculosis are not more effective than they are. I'll remind you that we discussed in the last talk the Mitchison hypothesis that's been with us for some time, proposing that uh, TB chemotherapy is problematic because the bacteria inhabit different tissue compartments and therefore adopt different physiologies that make them refractory to one or more uh, anti-TB drugs. This idea, which has been around for quite a while now, might explain why the kinetics of killing with the antibiotics that we use against tuberculosis are in all cases uh, biphasic or multiphasic. So in this case, this is an experiment in which chronically infected mice uh, were treated with one of our frontline drugs, isoniazid, uh, via monotherapy. What you can see, uh, looking on the y-axis at the number of viable bacteria still within the lungs, that's a log scale, versus the days on chemotherapy, is that killing of bacteria by isoniazid, or INH as I'll call it, is not a log linear process. So initially there's a period of rapid uh, cell killing, uh, rapid being a relative term here. It's actually very slow compared to the action of most antibiotics against most bacteria. But the remarkable thing is that after about four weeks of chemotherapy, the killing essentially stops and the bacterial population stabilizes at a level about 0.1 to 1% of the initial population. So there's a very high frequency of survivors in the face of chemotherapy. We call these the persisters. We call them persisters to distinguish them from the resistors, which are bacteria that have evolved through mutation resistance to the antibiotics, because in fact this is a phenotypic metastable state that is not inherited by the progeny of these cells. So if you were to take these bacteria out of the tissues, regrow them in culture, reinfect animals, and treat them again, you would get exactly the same curve back. They are not stably, heritably resistant mutants. This is a purely phenotypic phenomenon that we know very little about, but clearly, if we could convert this biphasic curve to a log, simple log-linear kill curve, uh, that would be a major advance towards accelerating the clearance of infection with chemotherapy. Now, we can postulate that the reason for these biphasic kinetics is due to the existence, as Mitchison proposed, of a dormant subpopulation of bacteria that is killed with slow kinetics compared to the bulk bacterial population. If we uh, perform a simple mathematical uh, model in vitro, uh, sorry, in silico for, for this process on the basis of differential uh, killing dynamics of a fast population, that is a population that's killed with rapid kinetics, and that represents the bulk of the bacteria, maybe 99.9% .9 of the bacterial population, versus a slow population, the persisters, that's killed with very slow kinetics, and then calculate the composite of these two curves as shown by the blue line here, what we get is an almost perfect match to the experimental data. Now, of course, the fact that a model matches the experimental data does not prove that it is true, but it at least says that the idea is plausible. So according to the Mitchison hypothesis then, the persistence of TB in the face of chemotherapy is due to a set of environmental inputs leading to a phenotypic switch, in this case a state of dormancy in a subset of organisms which causes them to become these drug tolerant persisters. So there's a simple flow of information from the environment to the physiology of the bacteria and this is what's responsible for the recalcitrance of these bacteria to uh, killing with antibiotics. It's a very attractive idea and as I indicated in the last talk there's actually some clinical evidence in favor of this idea but there are some awkward bits about uh, this model as well. One of the most obvious and glaring being that the persister phenomenon is not peculiar to the in vivo environment. In fact, even if we grow a clonal population of bacteria in an azenic culture, just in a tissue culture flask in vitro, and then subject them to a drug like isoniazid, we see that the killing curve is at least biphasic, if not multiphasic, just as it is in vivo. Now, the kinetics of killing are quite different in vitro as compared to in vivo. I don't want to say they're the same, but the biphasic shape of the kill curve in vitro is essentially the same as what we see in vivo, suggesting that the persister phenomenon, although it may be modulated by the tissue environment, is not absolutely dependent, perhaps, on the tissue environment. In a way, this is good news because it means that we can study this phenomenon in a test tube rather than in an animal, and that, of course, 
greatly accelerates the research on understanding this persister phenomenon.